we just let some of the people roll in. Yeah. Um, so should welcome. We, should, yeah, should we just quickly introduce ourselves? Yep. Sure. So. Um, hi guys. I'm uh, I'm Manish. I'm the founder um, and CTO of Digraf Labs. Um, I will just be in the in the assisting uh, uh, position here, helping out uh, Ahmed. Ahmed is the one running um, uh, running this workshop. So over to you, Ahmed. Yep. My name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm going to be your host today, showing you guys how to build a social media app from scratch. We're going to start in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for people to uh, come on in. And yeah. Yeah, I think it looks like we have a we have a healthy um, healthy crowd here. Um, and as people are rolling in, I think I'll I'll, uh, I'll be watching over the the Q and A and uh, and the chat and stuff. Um, so feel free to put your questions in the Q and A. It's mm. it's um, better to put them in the Q and A so we are sure that we can get to all the questions. Um, um, and um, you know, we'll do our best to like get through all of them. Mm. And if you don't know how to use the Q&A, we'll go over a very quick tutorial in a couple of minutes. So don't worry about that. And if we don't get to your question during the workshop, we have a 30 minute Q&A after. So don't worry, we'll get to everybody's questions. Should we uh, get started? Yeah, let's get started. OK, so welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for attending the How to Build a Social Media App in 45 Minutes workshop. Uh, my name is Ahmed. Like I just said, I'm a software engineer at DGraph Labs. With me is Manish, the founder of DGraph. He's going to be answering all of your questions in the Q&A. Uh, so to, to be clear, we want you guys to use the Q&A. Uh, you can ask questions here, you can comment on other questions, and you can upvote questions that you find interesting. You're going to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom chat. Uh, there's, it should say Q&A. Uh, and then you can create questions, and Manish and the rest of the crew will be sure to answer them for you. All right. So make sure to ask any questions you have. If we can't get to them during the live workshop, we will get to them after. We have half an hour set aside just for Q&A. Uh, and any question, there's no question that's dumb. We're happy to answer any question you have. Uh, generally, yeah, that's it. One thing that I will harp on is we have a survey at the end, and we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, this helps us to make our next workshops better. And you have a chance to win limited time DGraph swag that you can't get anywhere else. So make sure to answer that survey. Coming right. Uh, right from my closet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I've already introduced myself. Uh, what are we going to cover in this workshop? So we're going to be building a social media aggregator, uh, specifically a tweet aggregator, similar to what we have currently at tweet.dgraph.io. Uh, so what this tweet aggregator is going to do is we pull all the GraphQL tweets. It's kind of like a customized tw Twitter feed, right? And it lets you filter, search, uh, sort, a bunch of cool things. We'll show you a quick demo right after this slideshow. Uh, but yeah, we're going to start creating that. We're going to go through schema design. The schema here is extremely simple. Uh, but we're going to show you how to create a GraphQL schema, how to use indexes, et cetera. Then we're going to get on to do, get on to DGraph Cloud. If you don't know what DGraph Cloud is, I will introduce that in a second. But we're going to create a GraphQL endpoint on there. Uh, we're going to set up our schema, and we're going to load our data all very quickly. We'll show you guys how fast it is to get started with DGraph on DGraph Cloud. Then we have already a basic UI boilerplate. We're going to link that UI to our GraphQL endpoint that we're going to get from DGraph Cloud. Uh, then we're actually going to do some cooler things. So for example, we're going to do a bit more complex queries with filters and sorting. And these are going to be dynamic. So we're going to have dynamic text, dynamic sorting. And we're actually going to do some very basic auth. Uh, there's other videos that we have that have covered auth more in depth. But we're going to do this very basic auth using a token. 
so that you can go in and delete any tweets that you feel like are not, not useful, boring, whatever, etc. All right, so that's what we're going to do today. Some of you might be asking, what is DGraph Cloud? So DGraph Cloud, uh, and I guess let's start with DGraph for those of you who doesn't who don't know what DGraph is. So DGraph is the only native GraphQL graph database. So it supports GraphQL natively, and it's a native GraphQL database. Nothing else like this exists. Uh, the easy, DGraph Cloud is the easiest way to get started with DGraph. Uh, literally, it should take you two to three minutes to get your first GraphQL instance up. And it's powered by DGraph under the hood, as you can imagine. Uh, we have three tiers. We have a basic, professional, and an enterprise. And basic is completely free. So you can use it for free forever. There is a bandwidth limit, but you can keep using it for free. So, so one thing, we will have all of the resources on this uh, GitHub link. It's going to be sent to you after. So if you don't have time to log in and follow along, don't worry about it. Everything that we have will be on this GitHub repo. Uh, we have a UI boilerplate here. We have the schema. We have sample data, everything that you need to recreate this video. We're also going to be sending you a recording of this video, hopefully either by the end of this week or by Monday, uh, so that if you're not fast enough, you want to see something again, see something more in depth, or follow along, you'll have a recording set to your email. It's that easy. All right. So to start us off, I'm going to show you an example of what we're going to be making. So this is actually our tweet, GraphQL tweet letter. Some of you might have seen this. Uh, this is a curated list of tweets. Uh, this is live scraping and everything. Pulls this, pulls a live twist, uh, pulls a curated list of tweets from Twitter. Uh, pretty much every tweet that mentions GraphQL, right? And the cool thing about this and what makes it more interesting than Twitter is you have a bunch of sorting options. You have tons of filtering. You can see who's hiring. Some funny jokes if you're, you know, you're in the mood. Uh, you can see some videos. We also have like every week we curate the top tweets in every category, so you don't have to filter through everything and see it. For example, if you wanted to see the most up-to-date list of tweets, you could click on one of our issues, and then we've gone through all the trouble of going through everything and curating this for you, right? So we're gonna create. Pretty much, our boilerplate is pretty much identical to this, missing a bunch of filters and stuff because we're trying to simplify. But we're going to create pretty much the same thing. So to start us off, we are going to create a schema. So our schema is extremely simple. Literally, it's going to be a tweet type, and it's going to have three fields. It's going to have an ID. It's going to have a text, which is a tweet text, right? Uh, and it's going to have the timestamp, the time that the tweet was taken. So the ID, we're going to use this to actually render the native tweet. Uh, and the text and timestamp are going to be used for filtering and sorting purposes. So I'm going to drop all the data from my backend. So you can pretty much start. The, so we can start from scratch. All right. And uh, so DGraph Cloud is at cloud.dgraph.io. Feel free to like jo uh, to join along, make an account. You can follow along. I'm going to go take this relatively slowly. So you should be able to follow along. And if you want to create a new backend, you can use the starter completely free, like I said. And the one megabyte a day should be more than enough for this demo. So. Let's grab our schema and overwrite this. So this is the same schema that we just went through. Uh, I will go a bit more in depth on this search directive in a bit. All you need to know right now is this will let us search the text uh, you know, using a search bar uh, that you can actually search the tweet text. So let's deploy this. So right now, we have nothing in our database, right? because we've dropped all the data. We want to insert a bunch of tweets. So this is a curated, oh, let's grab this from the repo. So let's 
let's grab the mutation. So you'll see a file called example mutation in the repo. Uh, this will have uh, probably around 30-ish tweets. We've just picked the latest tweets from our feed. And this will insert it into our database. So if we join this. Oh. All right, and we've inserted that. So now we have 26 different tweets in our database. So moving on, if we go, we want to go to the overview. We want to grab our GraphQL endpoint. And then we'll go into the app. We'll go into the app.js. And you can see that we have a constant here, the GraphQL URL. So let's replace this with what we have. And let's run this. So we have the React app running. And if we refresh, now you can see that we've inserted 26 different uh, tweets, right? And it's actually showing that native tweet. It gives you a nice styling. The same thing that you would get on Twitter. Uh, yeah. So right now you can see that if you if you change these or you type anything into here, nothing happens, right? Right now this is just a basic boilerplate. But we're going to go in and we're going to add these functionalities right now. All right. So uh, a quick overview of how we're actually linking our app to our GraphQL endpoint. We're using Apollo client. And we are wrapping our whole app in an Apollo provider, right? And we pass our URL into the Apollo client. And this lets us, so now that we've wrapped our whole app in this, and we go to the basic tweet view, then we can use the use, muta use query and use mutation hooks, right? So this makes using GraphQL with React extremely easy. So right now, this is our, our query. Very simple. We're just querying all of the tweets, right? Super basic. We, what we want to do is we want to add a couple of things. Number one, we want to add pagination. Right now, we load all of our tweets at once. Then we want to add some sort of search mechanism, right? Uh, let's say I want to search specific tweet for a joke, for example. Uh, we're going to need to use a filter for that. And then we're going to also add sorting. We're going to be able to sort our tweets from the newest and the oldest tweets. So the first thing we'll need to do is we'll need to add some, some extra arguments into our GraphQL query. So the first thing we're going to add is we're going to add, we're going to add a sort order and a sort field. This is going to let us just basic sorting, right? So these, So order and sort value or sort uh, field. Are gonna let us sort our app dynamically. So by choosing, if we go back to the UI, by choosing either newest or oldest, it's gonna let us sort this whole tweet field dynamically. All right. Hey, um, hey, Ahmed. Um, I think we're getting some feedback that uh, mm -hmm. because there's a lag in Zoom. Oh, the right, right. Changes that you do, you just like do them a bit slowly. Okay, okay. So let me slow down and let me restart that section uh, for those of you that weren't able to catch it. Okay, so pretty much what we have right now is we have query tweets, right? Uh, so this is a basic query. What this will do is we'll turn, it will return all of the tweets that we have in our database. Uh, it will return the ID and the text of each tweet. And that's it, right? There's no pagination. There's no sorting. There's no filtering, right? OK. So what we want to do is we want to start out by, if you go to the UI, you see that we have a drop down for newest and oldest, right? So we want to be able to sort our tweets by the timestamp. So what we'll do is we will go in. Right? We will add. So query tweets is actually GraphQL. 
open, I guess. You can go, uh, so you can actually pass in parameters such as sort, filter, uh, and that's how we're going to actually make this query a lot more dynamic. So we're going to start passing in, for example, the sort options. We're going to pass in that, any filters that we have. We're going to pass in pagination info, uh, and we're going to get everything working. So what we'll need to do is we're going to add an order field. And inside this order field, we're going to have our sort field. And then sort order. OK, so these we're going to actually replace dynamically using JavaScript. Uh, this sort field is going to be the field that we want to sort on. Right now, it's only going to be timestamp. Uh, but for example, if you had the number of likes on the tweet, you could sort with that as well. Uh, you could also sort by the number of, uh, for example, the number of followers that the person who published the tweet has. Uh, this can be very dynamic. Uh, if we have time or if there's any questions, we can get into this. Uh, but right now, we're going to keep this simple. Just sort field, sort order. And then we have a function already here. Uh, this is just some boilerplate that will actually replace our sort order by, if you look at the sort options, we have newest and oldest. So the field will be the timestamp, and then it'll be ascending or descending. So let's add this function back into the, to the generate query function. So we're going to go replace sort bars. All right. So, um, I have the question <clears throat> from a Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. Which uh, editor are you using? Oh, so I'm using VS Code. VS Code. Yeah. And another question is, why are you using a string replace instead of Apollo client variables that are simpler to use? Uh, so, to my knowledge, Apollo client variables you can't use substitute fields and stuff for them, right? They need to be values. So, for example. Uh, and I can show if needed. We could have the sort order, for example, be an Apollo client variable. Or if we're sorting for a specific value, we could pass that in as a variable. But I don't think you can have the actual field be a, <clears throat> be a, a variable. So that's why we're doing a dynamic query like this. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, I'm just trying to get the Q&A screen back for me because it has crashed. Uh, so there's also another question by Alexi. So the endpoint is a simple network socket. Uh, there's two answers to that. It can be, if you're using subscriptions, it can be a simple network socket. Uh, but right now we're actually using it just as an HTTP endpoint. All right, so hopefully that answers both of your questions. All right, so back to our query here. So. Uh, you can see that we've added so these need to be changed in order. So we need to sort order first, actually, and then sort field. But yep, if we go back to our UI, now we can see it's loading. And you can see it goes from July 18th all the way down to July 17th. So you can see that it's in newest to oldest. If we decide to flip this. Then we have stuff all the way back from May. Wow. Uh, and then June, right? June 16th, June 17th. And then if we scroll down, we have June up to July 17th. So just by adding, what we've done is we've added, we've just added the order and sort order, sort field. And we've dynamically replaced these in the query. Uh, we were able to get sorting out of the box pretty much. Uh, OK, so any questions about sorting? Or should we move on to filtering?
All right. So let's move on to filtering. So filtering is honestly just as easy. Uh, if you remember in our GraphQL schema, we had the search by full text. This is where this is going to come in key. So what this does, and we can actually go back to the Graph Cloud to show this. So if we go query tweets, and we go filter, actually, we can see this in the, doc the documentation better. So if we go query tweets, and we look at the filter, now you can see that the text actually has a string full text filter. So what this means is it's going to let us search. Uh, number one, it's going to let us search the text. And number two, it gives us two options on how to search the text. So we're going to, we can pass in a number of terms, and then it will try and find all of those in the GraphQL query or in the GraphQL tweet uh, or any of text. So for example, how these would differ is if I searched up uh, orange juice, right? All of text would uh, only look for tweets that have orange and juice. Any of text uh, would only look for any tweet that has orange or juice in it. So let's see this in action. So let's go back. And what we're going to do here is we're actually just going to add a filter field, right? Uh, and this is because you can actually have more than one filter, right? So for example, if you wanted to search for text and limit it by time range, you could do that. And the boilerplate actually includes support for this. So if you can see here, this filter up here will be replaced by this. If we have any filters, it will be replaced by this. So filter, and then it'll be an and. So what this will do is it'll let us have more than one filter, and every tweet has to be checked for all of these, right? So if it was a time range and a word, then it would have to fulfill both the requirements to be shown, right? You can obviously use an or as well. Uh, and then you can add all of your filters inside. So you can have multiple filters here, right? So the filter we're going to use, we're going to use a basic search, right? So we have a search value linked to our search bar. And what we're going to do is we're going to dynamically replace or insert this filter if we put anything into the search bar. So if we have a filter in here, we'll create, we'll use this base filter and insert all of the subfilters inside. Otherwise, we'll just return nothing, right? There's no reason to add a filter into the query. So let's go add this into our generate query function. So we're going to replace. We're going to replace the filters that we added. And then we're going to replace that with the output of the generate filters function. All right. Did we save? Filters. Ah, so I just made a typo in the query. All right. Now you can see, and we can actually open up the network tab to show you guys exactly what's happening. So a lot of stuff happening because we're asking Twitter to embed all their tweets here. But if we search up GraphQL, let me see if I can zoom this in a bit. So you can see that right now we're only searching query tweets and an empty filter. So no filters at all, right? But once we type something in here, so for example, let me look up tutorial. OK. So if we go back down here and we take a look at this, now you can see that we're adding a text filter, so a filter on the text field. And it's of type all of text. So every uh, term that I enter in here will need to be found in it in the tweet. And the search term, which we typed into the bar, is tutorial. right? And you can see that it's filtered. There's only four tweets. Yeah. and. Like, as you can imagine, this is extremely easy to add to your program. It literally took us uh, a minute or two. So to show you guys the all of text, so for example, if I search up a tutorial Apollo, and one other thing to note is the, the any of text and all of text, they operate on terms, right? 
So each word is a term. For example, we have tutorial and we have Apollo, right? But if I remove the O from Apollo, it says there's nothing found. There's nothing called Apollo, right? Uh, if you want like a uh, word, partial word search, there's other indexes you can use. The benefit of the, the full text filter is it has some sort of word comprehension. So for example, if I enter tutorials, it still finds tweets that have tutorial, right? I didn't, there's no tutorials here, but it's smart enough to understand uh, plurals. It's smart enough to understand like future tense, past tense. So like, for example, if we can see here, there's cooking. So if I put cook, it's smart enough to understand that, okay, this word is the same, oh, oops, is the same word in essence. So yeah, that's the basic, basic filters. Uh, we're able to add this really quickly. There is some boilerplate that needs to be added, but this is all available to you in the repo. Uh, and yeah, that's it for filters. Any questions? Manish had to jump off, I think. So let's have a mm. look if there are any okay. questions in the Q and A. Let's do it ourselves. <laughs> so is the DGraph Explorer available in the self-hosted version of the DGraph product? Uh, so if you're talking about the GraphQL Explorer, this is literally just a themed. So let me pull up the cloud page. This is a themed version of Graphical. Uh, so if you search up Graph IQL, you can just download this and use this locally. There's also a couple of other options such as uh, GraphQL Playground. And yes, these work out of the, on the self-hosted version of DGraph as well. You point them to your GraphQL endpoint and it works out of the box, autocomplete, uh, all the good stuff. If you use a GraphQL client, can we eliminate stores like Redux or Mobix, or will we use a mix of both for state management? Okay, so obviously this is not an authoritative answer. That your needs might be different, but uh, from what I've seen, because Apollo client, uh, let me see if I can bring this up for you. So Apollo client actually has a cache, right? Which is in practice, very similar to the way both Mobix and uh, uh, what was it called? Redux both work. So you might be able to just replace this completely. Uh, in some of our projects, we were actually able to remove Mobix completely. So you could definitely. Mm. How does DGraph search compare to Alice? Applications such as Elastic and Solar. So I'm actually going to leave this one for to the end. This is a lot more complicated. And I think Manish could bring a lot more insight to this question. So if he decides, or if his electricity cooperates, uh, he'll be back to answer this. Otherwise, I will give you my best effort answer. All right. So hopefully that answers, uh, let's see, Kyle. So is there any plans to support a tokenized fuzzy search? Yeah, so there is, there is other indexes that support fuzzy search. Uh, so if we pull up the graph, GraphQL indexes. So for example, uh, hash will give you fuzzy search out of the box. Uh, where'd the question go? <laughs> yeah, so it will give you fuzzy search out of the box. Same thing as exact, right? Uh, both of them will give you fuzzy search out of the box. There is a bunch of different string indexes that you can play around with. Each of them functions in a different way. Uh, some of them might be better for you. I just decided to show the full text because of some of the cooler functionalities of like word comprehension. Okay. And if you guys have any follow-up questions to the questions I answer, feel free to either post another Q and A or post it, uh, preferably post it in the Q and A because it is a kind of hard to follow the, the chat. Uh, so what's the difference between full text, exact, and hash search? So exact and hash are similar. Uh, 
Hatch has better performance than Exact. Uh, they both are fuzzy searching. They will give you an exact match. So if I search Apollo, it will return Apollo, right? Uh, they're both the same thing. Full text, uh, it actually works on terms, right? So every word is a term, and it has a basic dictionary comprehension of word composition, right? So you saw that cook match cooking. It also match cooked, uh, right? Any word that has the same root, I guess, will be matched. Uh, and tutorial and tutorials are both matched together, right? All right, TF IDF scoring. Uh, I want to say that trigram might be useful for this. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Anthony, okay. So the whole input can be a, really okay. So that's actually that's on my side. Then I didn't know that that was possible. So, yeah, maybe actually I might update the tutorial after this workshop to actually use them, because I didn't know that you can have like actual field names be variables. Okay. Um, and yeah, that seems to be all the open questions for now. All right, so moving on. So let's say I don't like some of these tweets. So let me open up the tweet letter again. Let's say, for example, you know, this guy's tweeting about Phoenix and Elixir. And I'm like, no, I don't want this on my my feed, I got to get rid of this, right? So I'm going to need some sort of admin functionality, obviously. So if I'm hosting a website like this, I don't want anybody to be able to go in and delete whatever tweets they want, right? So we will need some sort of authentication. So what we'll do is dgraph actually has built in auth. So let's go back to our schema. And we're going to have to add two separate parts here. So I'm going to copy this because this is a, a mouthful to type. But pretty much, you need to add a comment called dgraph authorization. And you'll pass in a bunch of authorization settings into this. So for example, the header that the token will be coming on, the namespace that variables will be found in, the algorithm that you use for your key. So because we're going to be using JWT, the IO to create a web token from scratch. Uh, I'm going to use HS256, but this can also be RSA256. And yeah, then you pass in a key. So this is the most basic, simple implementation of authentication on dgraph, right? So I have a key, I have a header, a namespace, and an algorithm, right? Uh, keep in mind that this can be this authentication implementation can actually be used by things like Auth0, Firebase Auth, pretty much any. You can use, create your own Auth uh, server that serves JWTs. Pretty much any external Auth server can be used with dgraph Auth. Uh, and it's very flexible and very powerful. But we're not going to go super in depth into this unless we have questions. Uh, this is just going to be a very, very basic way to secure your, your social media app. So now that we have these, we're going to head over to JWT.io. You can see the algorithm is HS256, same as what we put in our schema. Uh, you can see that we have an object here, the same name as our namespace. So the one limitation is that you need to be able to have a field that contains an object. And inside this, you can look at any variable, right? But it has to be inside this namespace. Uh, you can see that I put my very secure key down here. Uh, this is what we're going to use to sign. And yeah, we have an expiration. This is at 630. So we still have tons of time. And then we're going to grab our key. But some of you might be wondering, like, how, how is this off? I have, we haven't really done anything to lock anything down. And you're right. We actually haven't added the actual off part yet. So to actually lock down different types, you need to add an at auth directive. And then you need to choose one of four. So for right now I have delete, but I could have used update. I can use add, update, query, or delete, right? 
So you can have different rules for each of them if you want. And we're going to add a delete rule. So sure, ideally, we should add something for update as well. But once you know how to do it for delete, you can do the exact same thing for update. And we're going to add a rule. Now, this rule is going to be a basic check. So we're going to check our user field inside of our namespace. So if you look back here, we have a user field. And the user is Ahmed. So we're going to check if that user, and this dollar sign just denotes that it's a variable inside this namespace, is equal to Ahmed. Right, so only I am able to delete things in this uh, this implementation. But this rule is extremely flexible. You can also pass in queries. So, for example, I could pass in a query where the user has to be equal to the user that created the tweet. For example, uh, and it's extremely powerful. You can actually, like, when you set this up properly, you can actually expose this to the front end, uh, something that, to my knowledge, only Firebase allows you to do. Uh, you can expose this directly to the front end, and you can have front ends talking to your database directly, uh, which for an MVP or something like that saves you a ton of time. So we're going to deploy this new schema. We're going to go back. We're going to grab this token. And so. Let me go over how this is going to work in the app. So we have an Apollo provider, but we only really covered the basic Apollo client, right? which had a cache, and it has a URI, which is our GraphQL endpoint. What is all this? the rest of this code? So what this code is doing is we're actually going to create something called an admin client, right? which is when you log in as an admin. And what this is going to do is it's going to inject a header, which is the authorization header, the same header that we, the same header that we put in our schema, right? So we have header authorization, and then we're going to pass in a token, okay? And this is the token. If you look at our front end, if you look at our front end, you can see that this token is going to be put in here, right? And then we're going to pass, if we go back to the code. So we are passing on a key change. So if we pass in a key, we're going to create an admin client that has the token authorization and everything. And if we go in here, we can see that when we, so if we go down to visits right here. So this is our admin key. When we change the key, we're going to create a new uh, admin client, obviously not the most uh, optimal way of doing this. Ideally, you wouldn't want to change it every time your key changes. You want to have an enter button or something, but this is just for demonstration purposes. So very straightforward. All the boilerplate is here. You can literally copy and paste this into your app, and it should work out of the box. There's not much to really play around with here. And then so we can go back to our project. And you can see that when we enter a key, then you will get a variable called, so let's go back to basic tweet, authenticated, right? So if you look down here, you can see client updated. If the client has been updated with our key, that means that we're now authenticated. And if we go into the tweet, uh, if we're authenticated, we'll show the delete button, right? So now, now that we have this, we can actually delete a tweet. So for example, you know, I don't like Alexa, I don't like Phoenix. No, nobody's gonna, I'm not gonna share this with the world, right? For example, now if I refresh the page and I don't enter the key here, so actually let me enter a key to have the delete, right? Nothing, it doesn't work. So it doesn't work. If we enter, if we go, and enter a different web token. For example, let's get rid of this field, right? Let's copy this. Oops. And let's say I want to delete this coding is your passion. Doesn't work uh, because the token no longer contains the field that we're checking on in our schema, right? And yeah, uh, as you can imagine, this field can be dynamically created by an auth server by auth zero by Firebase auth, etc. Uh, yeah, and 
in about five minutes, not even, we were able to add authentication to our app. So let's go into are the auth features just described also available to slash users. Oh yeah, yeah. So DGraph Cloud and Slash, uh, I think this is going to be announced tomorrow, have actually become one platform. So yes, all Slash users can use every single feature that we have in GraphQL. Uh, why is the auth stuff under common? Is this a common practice? Uh, I can't answer if it's a common practice, but that's how we decided to pass in auth setup into DGraph. Um, this auth stuff in GraphQL, right? Mm. Um, the reason I think we put it under under comment was because uh, the idea was that you can then set your own headers that might be coming in from some other system, mm. um, and direct they can be directly shipped over to uh, to DGraph. So uh, having having it under comment allows you to specify the header and and specify what kind of stuff you want. Otherwise, the other option was that we would set the header to something specific to DGraph. And then you just have to always pass it. So it just gives you more flexibility. Um, that, that was the reason. Um, I also see one more question here about TF IDF scoring. I don't know if you answered so that. So I actually deferred that to you. And okay. Yeah. Yeah. So TF IDF scoring, uh, there's a full text uh, uh, search scoring feature. It's in our roadmap for this year. Um, we uh, plan to get to it. Um, I don't know if in Q2, but it definitely in, in, we'll, we'll try to get to in Q3. Um, and there's another question here about, hey, what's the uh, search compared to uh, applications such as Elastic and Solar? So DGraph full text search is, 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 is very sort of like comparable in terms of performance against Elastic. Um, the, the only uh, downside to DGraph uh, full text search is again, the TF IDF scoring that we don't have today. And so I think once we have that in place, then, then we will do some, some search rank analysis um, against Elastic and see how, how well we are performing. But we definitely see a lot of people who just use DGraph full text search um, because it performs equally well to Elastic. All right. I can run Lambda functions based on events like Firebase Cloud functions. Yes, yes, uh, you can. So we haven't gone into Lambda in this, uh, this workshop, but I can give you a very brief overview. So let's open the blogs, the docs. So Lambda lets you write JavaScript functions similar to the, the Firebase Cloud functions. Uh, you can have them on a type and you can have them call out to uh, pretty much they can use to my knowledge pretty much any javascript uh, functionality right so you can have them sit between a collection so a type in graphql uh, you can edit it you can type check it uh, you could uh, for example when you insert a collection table you can create a new record on a different table so yes this is all possible Uh, there is another question about, okay, so you said that dgraph auth is very powerful. When should we consider using Firebase auth or auth zeros? Okay, so that's a good question and something, yeah. So that part needs to be cleared up. So dgraph offers the auth authorization part, right? You need to either create yourself or use another service like auth zero or Firebase auth for the authentication part. So actually logging in, right? Once you have a token, that's where DGraph takes over, right? So once they're logged in, you know their role, you know, et cetera, then DGraph can lock down specific types, uh, specific functionality based on their role, their ID, et cetera. So you, ideally you need both. You need auth zero, Firebase auth, or your own auth server. So- um, Actually on that note, Ahmed, uh, you, uh, you had replaced the auth zero in being used in Google in DGraph cloud. Mm. Um, with our own, right? And is it is it is it open source? Because I think a few people were asking if it can be open sourced. So we're working on making it open source. It will be soon, and we will obviously let you guys all know. It's a plug-in and play auth solution for any Go and React app. Yeah, I think DGraph adds a, a a bunch of value because we can we are able to easily deduplicate um, the same user across different login systems, whether it's mm. Google or GitHub or email IDs. Um, 
uh, because GitHub is a graph graph platform. Um, so yeah, we recently replaced Auth0 with with our own solution, which is what um, Ahmed worked upon, and and hopefully we can make it open source for you guys. Um, to the next question, I think it says along the lines of ITF IDF, what about further expanding beyond to embedded embedding vectors? Um, I think yeah, once we get to the to the to the focus on how do we improve full text search, just because it's 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 a lot more uh, popular compared to everything else that we do, all the other indices that we do. Um, we will look at the latest state of the art, art research and uh, and see if 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 um, you know if TFIDF is, is sufficient or, or should we look into things like embedding vectors and stuff like that. Um, next question is, uh, Manish, is there a way to use fuzzy searching with tokenization uh, today? Um, from my understanding of the docs, we can either have tokenization via full text index or term index or fuzzy search against the entire string via trigram index and fuzzy query. Is there a way to get, is there a way, any way to get both together today? You could you could add trigram index and term index together, um, and uh, the fuzzy search would just use the trigram index and the uh, the ter the term sort of like the, the equality and the term searches would use the term index. You could have you could have multiple indices on the same on the same predicate. I think if I understand your question correctly, I think that should that should do it. Uh, the next question maybe Ahmed you want to take about if you would like to go for serverless, but you still need some sort of business logic, maybe validations, etc. Where would you put that? Right. So in our model, we would push you towards the lambda functions, right? So you can have hooks, you can have type specific functions, so you can have a logic run before you insert something into the database, after you insert something to the database, etc. And that should handle most. If, unless you're doing something extremely complicated, that should handle most of your basic business logic. Yep, that's right. Um, and the last question is: so if so, if we use dgraph, we wouldn't need a backend uh, question. Uh, I'm new to the whole GraphQL versus REST from the GraphQL use case. I've seen it looks like GraphQL is usually used as an interface between database and front end. And I think that's the interesting thing about dgraph is that. Uh, particular DGraph cloud is that um, we have we have taken those layers, which are database, GraphQL, uh, some business logic, some caching, and so on and so forth, and put them all into, into one single unified in unified system, which is which is essentially the DGraph cloud. And so you can use you can expose parts of your data via GraphQL while still having a bunch of your data uh, be um, just in the in the DGraph database accessible via DQL, right? And then you can also have the GraphQL be calling DQL to run more complex queries, uh, which are possible. Um, so, so in in one system, you actually get the database and you get uh, the GraphQL. You get multiple levels of um, uh, of security as well because you have the GraphQL auth and then you have the cloud auth, um, and um, and so on and so forth. So, and then you have the Lambda function. So um, if you use DGraph Cloud, then you don't need to necessarily have uh, another backend. Um, you just have to think about how complex is your business logic and whether Lambda functions are sufficient for that, or do you need to have a bit of um, uh, a business logic layer above the DGraph, um, DGraph Cloud. Does that sound about right, uh, Amit? Okay, Kubernetes operators for DGraph. You may want to answer that one. Uh, yeah, so we, um, I think we are planning to build Kubernetes operators for the DGraph cloud. Um, I think I'll have to check with the team if there are Kubernetes operators planned for uh, DGraph self self hosted. Uh, but again, I think the focus for the company is to is to get the DGraph cloud. Uh, uh, in a really good state. And so we're definitely building some operators for that. Um, and um, uh, if, if any of these questions we are not able to answer sufficiently, please do ask them on discuss.dw.io as well. Um, so, because we have a bigger engineering team looking at that, they should be able to answer it uh, much better. Mm. Um, there are some questions above uh, Ahmed uh, at the top. At the top. 
And just make sure you read out the questions someone in the chat is asking, because they're obviously right, not right. reading the, the Q&A along with you right. guys. Uh, so we have, we have plans for posting a basic job. Yeah, actually, so we have, for a cloud, we've actually created yeah. our own um, auth system. Let, let oh, me, so actually, let me read question, it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the question is, do, do you have plans for posting a basic tutorial, creating a custom Jot server in Golang that can be connected with dgraph? Yeah, so we've created our own custom auth implementation, and we're planning to open source that. So that obviously uses dgraph. So you can literally, it'll be like a boilerplate. You can go and you can just plug it into your app. And it, it will be running off of DDoF Cloud. So you don't have to like spin up any other backend or whatever. Um, right. And we also have like Google sign in, GitHub sign in. So it's not just a bare bones. Like we're using this in production. Yeah. Um, yep. And I think we also have plans to make it so that if you have webhooks, they can be triggered. They can be triggering the Lambda functions directly. And the Lambda functions can then be doing a bunch of work that needs to be done. So, so the idea is that if you need to have a webhook which Google calls into or GitHub calls into, that would just be a Lambda function that you run on DDoF Cloud. Um, did we sufficiently answer the question about uh, DDoF auth is really powerful? Then should we consider using Firebase auth or auth zero? I think so, but Carol, if we didn't, feel free to ask another question. All right. Um, okay. They're running testing on browser. Can you edit and save editing code directly to site localhost? Uh, so do you mean the queries? Yeah, you can copy and paste them from the the API Explorer and use them in your application. They're the exact same queries, right? Um, there's a question about Apollo GraphQL. Where does that fit in the architecture and is it needed? Mm -hmm. So if you're using um, DGraph GraphQL, you don't need to use Apollo GraphQL. Um, you, you, you get all the functionality of um, GraphQL directly from, from DGraph itself. But um, you might want to use Apollo GraphQL if you're talking to other services which are sitting alongside DGraph and um, you want to have a unified GraphQL view um, across all of these services. Um, that's when people use um, the dgraph under uh, Apollo GraphQL. So what happens is the user asks for a, a much larger GraphQL query and portion of it gets executed by other, um, other, other, other services and portion of it gets sent over to dgraph. And dgraph being a GraphQL system, it can, it can, um, it can completely execute the entire GraphQL query. Apollo doesn't have to play the iterative results and, and sending more and more queries to dgraph part. So Apollo can directly transmit whatever portion of dgraph, it, it can execute directly the entire GraphQL query to dgraph and run that. Um, next question is unrelated to this topic. Will you support another language than JavaScript in Lambda functions? Uh, yes, we are. Um, in fact, working on supporting lots more languages than JavaScript. Um, and uh, we're hoping that we, that should be out in May. Um, and so, yeah, definitely it'll go way beyond uh, JavaScript. Uh, would they be JVM based? Um, I'll have to check back about that. Um, I mean, I, I think, sure, they, they, um, the way the new system works, there is no reason why they cannot be Java based. Um, or or Python or whatever languages that are out there. Um, so, but I think I can definitely give you an answer. If you just ask this in discuss.dr.io, we can elaborate a bit more, um, but we, it would support a lot more languages than, than JavaScript. Uh, there's a question at the top about why are you using a string replace instead of Apollo client variables? I think we answered that, right? We did, yeah, you just need to. Okay. All right. All right. right. Any more questions? Do we have last time left? chance? Let's just remind people about the survey then. <laughs> oh, last question coming in. <laughs> uh, so you. How did you get the idea to build this? Uh, DGraph. Well, I think the, the, the idea for DGraph comes from my experience uh, building a graph serving system for Google's knowledge graph back at Google. 
um, we had this problem that we we had a bunch of structured data systems um, running uh, one boxes like uh, weather and events and movies and flights and so on and so forth. Then we had to unite them into one single graph indexing and serving system equivalent of the web search indexing and serving system. So the name dgraph also sort of derives from the project that that was at Google. Um, and, um, and and then from there, um, as we started to, to work on dgraph, GraphQL came about, this is in 2015. Um, and decide to use GraphQL and, and, you know, and the rest is history. Um, so GRPC is used. If GRPC is used, won't that allow more language support? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, it does. I think, uh, we have official DRAF client libraries in a lot of languages. I think obviously go then Java, C sharp, um, uh, Python, JavaScript, TypeScript, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, some people have built in an elixir as well um yeah so so DR, grpc definitely supports a bunch of languages and we we try to we we, we have done we have tried to do a decent job at at uh, providing official libraries we also have a bunch of community contributed libraries which might also work for you guys um uh, I, I love you guys. You're super kind with everyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you attending. <laughs> Does DRAF support logic inference? Um, I, I don't, I think the answer is no, uh, but I'll have to just double check on that and, uh, and see, yeah, DGRAF does not try to infer stuff that should be like, that would generally be done outside of DGRAF. Um, I think somebody has asked um, on, on the chat, do you know if it's possible to serve files from Google Drive to UI page? Mm. Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I do know that. So if you're, are you asking, can you serve it through dgraph? Or just generally? Because I think you can generally. Yeah, it's not, it's not clear from the question. Mm. Um, I'm still confused between GraphQL and DQL uses. Is there a detailed comparison available? So the way to think about GraphQL and DQL is that is GraphQL is the official spec. Uh, and, um, and, uh, you know, the great thing about Gra GraphQL is that it is in the, in the ecosystem, uh, it is very well integrated. So all of the GraphQL editors would work with, work with, with, the, with any GraphQL sort of, um, system. And the thing about DQL is that it, it's a fork of GraphQL and we forked it back in 2016. Um, it's a fork of GraphQL, which is designed to be a lot more, um, uh, allow for a lot more complex queries, stuff like uh, variables in the queries, which can be reused or query blocks to, to allow like writing, um, to, to make it easier to read and write queries. Uh, we have, um, we have a whole bunch of like, um, more complex complex things. And so what we see is that people end up like, uh, for anything complex, they end up running, writing DQL query, but then calling it via GraphQL. And there's a way to do that by just setting the DQL query in the schema. Um, so you get to DQL once, graph, once you start hitting the limitations of GraphQL, that's the right time to like jump into DQL and learn how to use it. Is DGraph platform specifically for the developers, those who are interested in app development? Um, I think it's 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 both. It's definitely for people who want to do app development because GraphQL is natively supported. It does it does um, you know Lambda functions. It, it it takes care of like auth. In fact, it has multiple levels of auth so and so forth. But um, um, also, it's it's used a lot by by um, companies who are looking to build a graph platform like Unify unify the data uh, sources that they have. So for example, people might have data stored in SQL databases or MongoDB or, or some, other, some other data storage systems, and they can put all of that into the DGraph um, uh, graph platform uh, and then be able to run, run queries across all of this to, to derive interesting things. And so, so it's definitely used to serve websites, but also be used to serve um, um, kind of the kind of query traffic that would not have been possible um, otherwise. How important is it to know Golang to work with DGraph? To, to use DGraph, you don't need to know Golang at all. Um, if you want to contribute to DGraph, then, then yes, it's all written in Go. 
Okay. I think should be, um, looks like we almost um, out of time here. Emma, do you want to do a plug about these um, feedback form? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So like I said in the beginning, after you guys leave, you will get a survey from Zoom. We would really appreciate if you guys fill that in. Uh, number one, it'll make our workshops better in the future. And number two, like I said, limited edition swag that you can't get anywhere else. You can show off to all your friends, you know? So yeah, please fill that in. Uh, we would really appreciate it. And thanks and, and also, for... yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, do one more thing. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube. All of the workshops and the talks tomorrow will be recorded on there. So if you want to revisit anything, uh, everything will be on our YouTube channel. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for, for joining in today and uh, and asking all these questions. I think it's it's always a lot more fun when, when the workshops are interactive. Mm -hmm. um, and there's definitely a very, uh, very fun workshop for us to run. And hopefully it was equally enjoyable for you guys to, to attend as well. And uh, tomorrow is a DGraph day uh, conference. So please do remember to dial in tomorrow. I think it starts at 9 a.m. Uh, uh, Pacific time, San Francisco time. Um, um, so please do dial in and uh, learn about all the stuff that community has built with DGraph and all the stuff that's coming in in DGraph cloud. Should we uh, conclude, Damod? Yep. Well, thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate it. And we hope to see you in our next workshops. Uh, yeah, thank you. There's, there's one more workshop happening today evening, I think, uh, by Bill Kennedy. Uh, he's, uh, I, I think, one of, I think Bill Bill runs some of the best workshops uh, in in the that I know of in the market. Um, what time is is that? Do you know? It should be right after. He's this. at one uh, thirty. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, so that's happening in half an hour. I definitely highly recommend people checking out Bill Kennedy's workshop. Um, uh, I think there's there's always so much to learn. Uh, from every workshop that I've seen uh, Bill, Bill run. Um, so really excited about that workshop. And that's gonna be a, a bit longer workshop as well. I think it runs for like four hours, if I'm not wrong. Um, he goes really deep and he really like kind of tries to tackle how would you go build, how would you go build stuff which can run in production, right, from scratch. So it's an amazing workshop, do check it out. All right, thanks guys. All right. Thanks. <laughs>